Hi, I'm Cynthia and this is your Hollywood dream. We're here today with Stillman. Well, hi, I'm a writer. My name is Ryan Stillman and I write um, comedies and I specialize in uh, comedy songs mainly. And I'm really looking forward to today's topic. Claire. Hi, I'm Claire Strofield. I'm a writer and focusing on drama, a one hour drama for telly. And Gosling, why do we call you Gosling? Because my name is Ryan and I am also Canadian and hopefully we're twins. Um, anyway, I'm a writer performer in Toronto and happy to be here. So thank you. All right, today's topic is Top Gun and sequels in general. So let's get the conversation going. Here we go. In three, two, one. Well, I I saw it, and I have to say, it was um, it was the best movie experience I've had in at least ten years. Really? Mm -hmm. Like the experience felt like when I was in high school and went and watched Speed with Keanu Reeves, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like what just happened? So first of all, did everyone see it? No? Oh gosh, what about spoilers? Can we not- That's fine, I wanna hear this because I'm so curious about sequels and all this and okay. it can't be worse than when someone told me about The Sixth Sense has got a ghost at the end. Oh, you know, like, like, someone I, told you the end of Sixth Sense? Before, yeah, oh. so. I, I'm, I can handle this, I've been here before. I'm excited. I wanna learn, a chance to learn from you, I'll take it, I'm taking it. <laughs> Okay, so, but Claire and Ryan W. saw it, right? Okay, so Claire, you you loved it. Ryan W., what did you think? Um, I gave it a 9.8 out of 10. Oh, 9.8, <laughs> that's pretty darn high. Yeah, I liked the experience, similar to what Claire was saying, where it, once it started, it really came out of the gates with a set tone. So you knew what to expect and you could go on that ride. There was no wishy-washy. It was true to the original, but fast forward by 30 years or so. Okay. I'm excited for that. That sounds awesome. Um, one of the things about Top Gun that I really loved is my roommate, she said, yeah, I liked it. It's very formulaic. And I thought that that was absolutely correct and absolutely comforting at the same time, because you could give into the formula and sort of go, I know where this is going, but I'm going to go on this ride as well and just enjoy it and take it for what it was. There was, there wasn't any trying to do any crazy right turns and oh look now there's a new villain or something you didn't expect. It was, here's what's going to happen. Here's how it's going to be executed. And it's so true when you can recognize a formula and recognize a type of storytelling, you do find comfort in it. Yeah, I know. I don't want to say anything. I about know. It. And what I thought was going to happen and what did happen. Um, but what I do want to say about actors is like, I really enjoyed the whole cast. I thought that they were all super like unique and you knew their personality and you're like, oh yeah, I've worked with people like that. So I really liked how much charisma they all had. Um, I loved the like, you know, the beach scene, you know, for a bit of fun, like everyone takes their shirts off, yeah, get in there. So I thought that that was good, you know, because it didn't take itself so seriously. And yeah. that's what made me relax and go, oh, this is fun. Like we can just have a bit of fun here. Right? Yeah. It wasn't overwhelming either. It didn't feel like a hundred things were happening. They're like, oh, jet fight sequence. Great. We can just like enjoy this, you know? And on the, that topic of shirts being off, I really <laughs> respect Tom Cruise for taking his shirt off and showing what a, you know, a not a young man looks like, right? I mean, he didn't look he looked fantastic. They didn't CG him abs, right? It wasn't like they um, they shot him in certain angles that made him look younger than he is. I mean, they let him look like he looks. And I would I thought that was great. I thought he looked, yeah, just kind of like all the other guys. Like I didn't notice a big difference, but um, yeah, I didn't I didn't sort of 
he didn't stand out in a, in a good or bad way. It just kind of blended in, didn't he? He did. And yet years ago, you know, a younger man might have, I mean, what I noticed was there was one shot where you showed, it was somewhere around his arm and you could see where he lost a little bit of, of volume up here, it's, you know, but it was like, so what? And, and I looked at that going, yeah, that's a 50 something year old man. And that's totally fantastic that he is, you know, because a, lo a lot of actors are very self-conscious about that shirt coming off and they work out for months and months leading up and they actually have weights on set so that they can flex before the, the camera rolls. Oh, potty pump. <laughs> the sequel, what I actually thought was also interesting is if you think about the original and we are possibly going to give away a tiny bit here, they, there are tons of different storylines they could have chosen to focus on right, for a sequel, but they chose one in particular. And I don't think we're giving it away if we say th that, are we giving it away? I need to ask the crew. So in the original, Goose um, dies, well, um, but that was, that he wasn't a main man. I mean, it was Val Kilmer, right? It was Iceman and it was, and I know Ice, Val Kilmer is not well enough to have a storyline focused on him. But they could have taken other storylines. <clears throat> they could have had, I don't know, uh, Maverick have a son suddenly. They could have had, you know, Maverick have a love that got away. I mean, they could have done a lot of things that would have lent itself well to a sequel story. Or you could imagine them coming up with other ideas like that. But they chose Goose and they chose Goose's uh, family and how they've been left with the death of Goose and how Maverick um, fits into that. And um, what they were able to do with that is they were able to use the idea of time and what that does, what, what loss does over time. Um, and, and when you are past 45, let's say, you know, there is that idea of looking back at your life and thinking, well, what what have I, what have I left? What is, you know, what, what have I done right, wrong? What are areas that I could do better? I mean, all sorts of things like that. And so they picked it up on a lot on a story level, which allowed Maverick to have even additional depth to being quote unquote heroic. Here we are in three, two, one. That's perfect. I totally agree with that. And how they wove the Goose family storyline into Maverick's conflict and what's revealed is, is very smart and very touching and makes a lot of sense. Yeah, rather than like they could have focused on the one that got away, you know, for, for Maverick, right? Or something, right? With Penny, which... Penny apparently was in the original. Do you, I don't remember her, but th that's, does anyone remember her? <laughs> apparently she was in the first 15 seconds. They could have been more focused on her. I mean, you've got a lovely actress, Jennifer Connelly and all this, but they really didn't do that as much with her as I thought originally going into the movie. I thought there was going to be more of a focus on her based on just seeing her on interview shows and whatnot. I felt that the story was really, like, I felt Tom Cruise was really gracious in the way that he allowed the story to unfold because it felt like he was really stepping back and, like, watching the original but with a new cast of these kids. So it felt like the kid's story and then how, and, like, he was watching over them. Captain Pete Maverick Mitchell. Let me be perfectly blunt. You are not my first choice. You are here at the request of Admiral Kazansky, AKA Iceman. He seems to think that you have something left to offer the Navy. What that is, I can't imagine. With all due respect, sir, I'm not a teacher. So I really liked that. It didn't feel like, oh, it's all about me. It felt like, oh, this is the next generation. Like what's my part in this? Um, even though he was in the movie a lot, <laughs> it felt like it was focused on other people that was probably to me it's crowning glory how it managed to really show in an authentic way the
the transition from kind of that younger person's egocentric place in life in terms of their maturity and a later position where you've grown and matured and where you kind of, you realize you're, you're no longer the focus and you're absolutely willing and supportive of stepping, you know, aside and letting those who should rise to rise. So that was what was so nice about having this character really um, have a storyline that was right for, for, well, his age, you know, and what you might imagine him to have gone through. And then he did grow in the movie because you think about it, right? So like at the beginning, he still has that adrenaline junkie personality and he's still pushing the limits as a test pilot. And then then when you go to now he's not just responsible for himself like now he's responsible for all these kids lives and I liked that because it's like that was never really what he was about like he could push the limits hard because it was just him and like he didn't have people relying on him yeah so let's kind of take it back to the idea of the sequel though so what they did was they chose a storyline which allowed Maverick to really evolve and to also bring it back home to a heart. It brought him back to a place of purpose. And if you think about other sequels that have done that, I was oddly thinking of Alien and Aliens. Now that might date me and you are all like, I've never seen that before, it was in the eighties. Um, <clears throat> but in the original Alien, it was Sigourney Weaver who was a relatively undeveloped character who just happened to become the survivor of a ship that had been just uh, an alien had been on board. <laughs> they had actually brought it on board and the alien had killed everyone on the ship. She just happened to be the sole survivor. So then you have the second one, the sequel. What did the sequel do? Well, a couple of things it did. Number one, it up the ante, it up the level of peril. So in the first one, you saw one alien. In the second, it was now a swarm of aliens, which is why the S was added. But the more out crazy and sort of spectacular and peril raising and all of this that you have in any storyline, that is then where you must bring the story back to home so much more so. So what did they do with her character? <clears throat> they brought out the maternal side of her which never <clears throat> had anything to do with the first movie. We didn't even know she had a child. In the second, they brought in the idea that she had left her daughter at home and she had promised her daughter she'd be home for her 12th birthday. And so then they bring in this young girl who she has to save and this maternal part of her comes out. So they not only up the ante of the alien going to aliens and a mother alien that's giving birth to these other aliens, but they up the ante with Sigourney Weaver's character where she's now a mom protecting this young girl, right? So there was all these parts of what allowed that character to be bigger, the foe to be bigger and the heart to be even bigger. Okay, so that's why that was an incredibly successful sequel. It was actually more successful than its original. Then you have the idea, you go to Tom Cruise again in Top Gun. What did they keep pushing at the sort of like the beginning as he was like making his rounds? Does anyone remember how he's making his rounds and they're all saying, oh, Maverick, yeah. And then they always had the same comment. Oh, yeah, that it was phasing out like humans in planes were getting phased out. Well, that was one comment. They kept saying, still a captain, are you? All oh, right. His ranking, yeah. Yep. He had not moved in 20 whatever years, okay? So it's like he's still, 20 whatever, 30 years. He still hadn't moved. He was still a captain. I associated immediately with that was good. I'm glad they didn't waste the time like they did in Star Trek. In Star Trek, Captain Kirk, when they had the TV series, he was a captain. This is back in the 60s. The very first movie that came out sometime in the 70s, I think, or whenever it was, 70s into 80s, they made him an admiral. And But 
they realized they that that was a whole a, 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 a ditch that they had written him into because the admiral doesn't do anything interesting. It's really the captain that does something interesting. So they purposely made it so Kirk defied orders so they could court martial him down back down to a captain. That was on purpose in terms of the writing because they because the writing part of it, the franchise realized so long as Captain Kirk was an admiral, he wasn't interesting. So they needed to make him a captain again so that he could actually do all those fun things that captains do. So what happens in Top Gun? He's never budged from being a captain. And yet Iceman is now, what is he, an admiral or I don't even, I don't, yeah, right? And all of his other graduating mates and whatnot have moved on, but he hasn't. And they made that a story point. They made sure that they stopped a lot, like everyone had that realization, still a captain, you know? And so that it's it's this almost an insult, but it's really not because it's like, thank goodness he's still a captain. I think you're absolutely 100% right on that. And that each, to tie in what Claire had said about the characters, each character's uh, micro storyline was served so well by the central conflict and that the growth of each character also was completed by the end of the movie. So the conflict was resolved and then the growth was resolved and shown and that full satisfaction came in at the end of act three. But yes, starting the people where they need to in order to go somewhere within the movie was crucial. I did like how they grew at the end. And it was like those feel good moments. And I'm not going to tell Ryan S how, <laughs> how that happens. I think we're all, this is kind of fun talking when someone's not seen it because we're being very considerate to- A little cautious. I wanted to, I wanted to ask Ryan, Ryan S like about what your favorite sequel is and why? That's a great question. I mean, to me, it's probably the second Star Wars, the original, like with Darth Vader. And I think it kind of goes to what Cynthia's saying, since you asked, like, I think they made it bigger and better and there was deeper conflicts and, you know, it had a great twist at the end with Darth Vader as his father. And I'm assuming back then it like blew people's minds when it came out in the theater, that that's who it is. And, you know, like that's a really, to me, that's a really good example of sort of like how to tell a story in general. Like that, that, that was a very good trilogy, you know? Um, well, okay, so here's the connection. Think about it this way. Alien one, no one had a family. Alien two, we find out Sigourney Weaver has a daughter and she in she's away from her daughter, but then she has to save this other girl that they find on a planet. And so mother-daughter relationship there, right? Um, Top Gun. It's not Maverick's family, but it's Goose's family that Maverick feels a responsibility to Star Wars. So Star Wars, the first one, we kind of thought Obi-Wan was sort of like Luke's father figure. And, and there's such a strong father vibe with Obi-Wan and Luke in the first one. And then Empire Strikes Back, what happens? Bam, we find out who really is Luke's father, right? So again, that parental relationship tie is in the second one. We have this sequel idea that you bring in some kind of parental or closer intimate feeling, some kind of whether it be a regret situation, a reveal, a lamenting, a guilt, a making up for, something like that, which is incredibly human. It's one of the deepest thoughts of humans. I just want to say something. It's also making me think of another obviously famous, famous sequel is like The Godfather Part Two, and how in a weird way what you're saying just resonated with me on how, you know, it's sort of like a father-son story told through different generations, right? Cynthia, if you remember it, like, yeah, it's so funny. I never thought about how much of a theme family plays in a good sequel. That's fantastic. That's amazing. Yeah. So going, you know, I'm sure you'll notice it now going forward with how that works. Now, it didn't work exactly that well. If you watched the Jaws um, movies, um, the, <laughs> because, <Son of> the, <laughs> because the, the, the first and the second were, you know, they kind of had a, okay, that it did work there. The first one, we have one, one shark after all these people. The second one, it did become more person because the shark went after the son, Sheriff Brody's son was in danger. So there was that aspect of it. 
but I think it was the third or the fourth, the four, I think it was the fourth. And the only reason why I know this is because my children watched it and I was forced to watch with them. The fourth one was something like the shark wants revenge. <laughs> Because it was like the shark's mother or something. And so now the new shark wants revenge. I don't know. So that didn't really work very well. That's okay. I've been thinking about Home Alone and Home Alone 2. And it's still like, you know, the first one's about the house. The second one is let's take them out of the house. But it's still all about the family and how to reunite the family. Again, both of them are reuniting. Yeah. The second one is just a broader geographical location, but still the fight to reunite with family and make amends and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yes. And the, the, the they did keep the the arc of the mother, right? The mother was similar in the first and the second Home mm -hmm. Alones, where she was, you know come hell or high water she was going to find her son and they definitely played into that you know similar to the first one but with the magic of new york city really and then you probably remember the last scene where she finds him at the christmas tree at rockefeller center because she suddenly realizes he loves christmas trees so she knows where he will be christmas eve i think or something mm -hmm. and so she runs to the rockefeller center christmas tree and sure enough he's there so Ryan S, are you going to go see it? Oh yeah, as soon as I can. I just think I have to wait for the like crowds to die a little down, like for like every record too. Okay, I think we've kind of done a bunch for today, talking about Top Gun and so many other sequels. And so thanks everyone for joining me today in this little chat. The Ryans, Gosling of course, <laughs> and Claire and Ryan S, we need to come up with a good one for you. The still man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. See you next time.